Welcome everybody to another OpenShift Commons. And today we're really excited uh, for the IBM Cloud Pack for Data team. So this new release has been eagerly anticipated for all of IBM's customers and Cloud Pack for Data users. And we're here with Clarinda Mascarenas, Offering Manager of IBM Cloud Pack for Data, as well as Clay Davis from Tech Data, very important partner. Uh, we love tech data. And then Travis and Partha are also here from the IBM Cloud Pack for Data team. Please take it away. We'd love to hear more. Uh, thank you so much, Karina. It's really a pleasure. Um, definitely. <laughs> it's been a great release for us this year. Um, and um, I will give you guys a quick overview of what we will be covering in our agenda today. So in today's session, uh, we will showcase the highlights of Cloud Pack for Data version 3.5 release um, with a quick demo of the deployment uh, using our operators, which is one of our uh, new capabilities and how it ties into Red Hat uh, Marketplace. And um, we've also onboarded this release um, in 3.5 on our uh, global distributors Tech Data's Marketplace. And we'll hear from Clay on why Cloud Pack for Data is important to them, uh, followed by a quick end-to-end -end demo that Travis will walk us through. Now, we've come a long way, um, you know, since 2.5 years. Uh, we're in our ninth release, uh, version 3.5. And in today's presentation, we will be learning more about the enhancements in this release. Uh, we just had a successful GA, like Karina said, prior to thanks the Thanksgiving week on November 20th. Um, you know, I just wanted to give some background, you know, what we exactly did like a couple of years ago through our data and AI portfolio uh, with data management, governance, analytics. Um, you know, we tried to build uh, the best tools, uh, point solutions uh, for the different use cases, but Clients wanted to build a more comprehensive uh, use case driven platform that had to go through the pain of piecing these services together. And so since two years, um, our positioning is more from a platform perspective with Cloud Pack for Data. Uh, and many of you must have heard about Cloud Packs itself, uh, which are predefined use cases. Uh, we have six other Cloud Packs. It's to deliver our end-to-end -end experience with uh, a pre-integrated um, unified experience to end users. Um, I wanted to quickly um, give you guys also a feel for what our data and AI platform is. As we start from our foundation, which is based off OpenShift, Cloud Pack for Data is uh, truly a hybrid offering, uh, which can run on any public cloud, um, on premises, avoiding vendor lock-in. And as you can see in the three boxes here that we have, um, we have data management services. Um, there is always a need to use data from diverse sources, allowing you to manage your enterprise data through a single plane of glass, no matter where it lives, uh, through data virtualization. Our main differentiating factor, which is data governance in the center through the organized uh, rung of the ladder. Um, well, like I could say, you know, it's important to understand your data um, that is actually required for AI. Uh, and, um, it needs to be trusted so that you can then analyze it uh, to build self-service analytics. And the last section, the last box is analyzed with our data science and analytics uh, support for best-in-class tools and open source frameworks um, that allow you to run your models across a variety of different environments. Think of it like build once and deploy anywhere. And of course, we have these different personas that you can actually see on the platform on the top. Um, now, quickly for version 3.5, I just wanted to uh, cover some of the foundational specifications. 3.5 supports OpenShift 3.11 um, and 4.5. Um, and uh, besides our different deployment options that I just called out, we are also introducing our support for Z, this release. Um, and um, also we run on storages, including the OpenShift container storage, uh, Portworks and NFS. Um, and we'll see in a bit, you know, with our growing ecosystem, um, also onboarding on the tech data marketplace, et cetera, um, how Cloud Pack for Data is uh, 
growing not just with IBM third party services, but also open source services. Um, now, the next thing I quickly wanted to cover is um, if you need an overview of the latest packaging and where the capabilities lie um, in 3.5, version 3.5, um, we have some base capabilities like you can see over here and then we also have extensions. I give a simple analogy similar to your iPhone. We have default apps which are part of your base services and you have always have premium services which are like extensions. Um, and all these services are pick and choose pre-integrated, it's a land and expand model based on your needs. This release, um, we are introducing new services in the base that you can see highlighted um, with uh, data management uh, console. We'll see details of that in a bit. Um, in the AI portfolio, we have the uh, WMLA, the Watson Machine Learning Accelerator for deep learning um, use cases, as well as um, data privacy enhancements. And then from an extensions perspective, um, we are introducing knowledge accelerators for different industries uh, for business vocabulary and then open pages, which is actually one of our GRC solutions um, and also an oil and ga uh, gas solution that we're introducing this release. Um, now quickly, just to summarize, um, you know, what are the high level themes in Cloud Pack for Data this release, um, given the times we are in? Um, we are seeing a trend of companies, uh, they're either in a survival mode, um, you know, uh, with a new normal or in they're in an accelerated growth mode. And um, having said that, our two high level themes to cater to both these types of needs are the cost reduction strategy and the innovation strategy. Um, and you can see from a cost reduction perspective, uh, and we will cover the details of each of these themes and areas in a bit, um, Businesses are looking to optimize their costs primarily through automation or IaaS or moving to cloud to optimize their infrastructure. And they're also looking um, you know, for return on investment. That's a very important factor. Additionally, when it comes to innovation, uh, they're more in a growth mode than trying to keep up with the increased demand for their business, uh, investing more in resiliency or risk management and data security or advanced DI. And we'll be seeing um, what each of these capabilities are actually going to cover in a bit. So from a cost reduction perspective, there are two main areas that I wanted to highlight here. One is improving user experience for more productivity, and then our simplified platform management and enhanced automation to increase time to value and efficiency. So we'll be focusing first on user experience for uh, more productivity. Um, the first important thing I want to call out here is you can see on the left hand side, uh, you have many different pain points when you use a platform and um, you have data located on many different servers, public clouds, many different user interfaces for different users. And it's painful for end users to get their job done, um, you know, uh, very, very seamlessly. And so you can see on the right hand side here um, is our unified user experience based on the job role and permission. So it's simplified from a persona perspective and um, it's experience around our users rather than the services that we have on the platform. And our design team has done a ton of user research studies and defined how the navigation will appear to make it more intuitive um, as well as provide ease of use for our end users. Um, the next capability that I wanted to cover is uh, in, in terms of our um, unified experience is for data engineers. Um, we wanted to give them a unified way to manage uh, the databases in one place. And without this tool, um, you know, it's called the data management console. You might need multiple consoles to manage native databases running on the platform. Um, so with this unified data management tool, um, you can use it to manage uh, data virtualization, connecting to any sources that are on public clouds, on-premises, et cetera, your DB2 databases on the platform, you know, to run your uh, queries, to monitor the performance. And this new console is actually built on a full set of open RESTful APIs. So anything you can do on the interface, you can also do that through our open APIs. Uh, so from, in short, in all, from receiving alerts and monitoring uh, hundreds of uh, databases and optimizing the performance of them from one screen, um, providing you a single view across the enterprise, 
to even creating, altering, um, and managing your database objects through the single interface. Um, so this is a great um, value add for us on our platform. The next important capability we have is uh, platform connections. Um, again, uh, there are two main goals here. We wanted to make sure that we use a common mechanism of connectivity across all our services on the platform and a common set of connectors across those services. And if you want to find a set of these connectors, they are available um, on our Knowledge Center. Please feel free to take a look. It includes IBM, third party, all different types of connectors, as well as custom um, JDBC connections that you can define. The goal is primarily you can define once and make it available in a catalog where you can use it from anywhere. And um, the main problems uh, this is trying to solve is primarily around reusability and streamlining the use of data sources um, across our platform. Um, now the next theme, uh, we covered some of the highlights in from a user experience standpoint to make to increase our productivity. The next theme is around our uh, unified platform management capabilities and enhanced automation. So, you know, we've seen in the past system administrators and end users often have a lot of difficulty um, in operationalizing um, and managing their data and AI workloads. Uh, so this has been one of the pain points. And what we've done this release is we've introduced a couple of capabilities. One is through our platform management. You know, system administrators on uh, containerized platforms, they have many services deployed and different resource consumptions and entitlements. Um, and they're very complex to manage on your own. So besides providing um, the capability to drill down from service to pod level to debug and correlate the issues, administrators also require visibility and control um, you know, of compute memory resources being consumed by users, services, and the platform and the visibility and control of the workloads across the platform, including all the services that are deployed. So what we've introduced this release is we are also giving the capability to configure resource quotas on CPU and memory for the entire platform as well as individual services. That way you can monitor your thresholds and receive email alerts uh, when usage exceeds the configured, configured quotas. And optionally, you can also configure um, a scheduling service to enable a soft enforcement of these quotas. That way, um, you know, you aren't exceeding what you've actually allocated. So this is one of the great capabilities this release. Um, the other important capability from a management perspective is um, oftentimes we've seen that a lot of the data science workloads, et cetera, um, that are running in production, they, we need to make it easy to monitor it um, as well as manage it over a period of time. Um, so we've introduced this capability in deployment spaces uh, with enhanced um, dashboarding capabilities uh, where um, you can actually see an integrated operations view uh, for the workload that you're running to depict the runs, the failures, uh, et cetera, as well as, um, you know, so that you can quickly find your issues and get a quick view across um, all the different spaces. When we say spaces, um, think of it as just a concept where we actually do our production level deployments on the platform um, so that you can access it through your apps, you know, your machine learning models, uh, through a REST API, et cetera. And this also builds the way for us to, uh, you know, to build on queuing and capacity planning uh, for these production workloads um, in phase two. Um, now, the next important capability, and I won't speak much to it because Partha is going to walk us through this demo, is our Cloud Pack for Data Operator. Um, it's an OLM-based operator for faster deployment and configuration, um, allowing you to install, uninstall, patch, and scale in an effective, um, as well as an automated, scalable way. Uh, so let's see it in action. Over to you, Partha. This is the first time a cloud pack for data has adopted the operator framework for installation and upgrades, which makes it easier for customers to adopt the platform and get uh, started in a quick way and uh, makes uh, installs and upgrades uh, easier. Historically, uh, we have been uh, using uh, 
tooling tool based installation and this is the first release where, where we have adopted the operator framework so in this uh, demo we have the red hat red hat marketplace uh, way of installing the cluster so here uh, i have in, registered the uh, openshift cluster in in this uh, red hat marketplace uh, console uh, so let me just uh, show you uh, how the experience is so uh, when i click on the uh, cluster console it will take me take me to the OpenShift cluster. Uh, while that opens up, uh, we can go to the, uh, the software that I have installed already on my Red Hat Marketplace dashboard. So uh, you see all the listings uh, as usual, and one of which is the IBM Cloud Pack for data. So uh, you can uh, install the operator from, from uh, this console directly. Uh, so what this does is, uh, it gives you a, a mechanism to install the operator, uh, pulling it from the IBM uh, operator catalog dynamically. So here, uh, I just click on the install operator and uh, what happens is it takes me to a page where I can uh, select the OpenShift project that I want to install it in uh, using the OLM mechanism. So here I, I select the OpenShift project called the Cloud Pack for Cloud Pack demo. And the inst installation is uh, started immediately, and uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, the operator is uh, installed and is ready for use. So this is my uh, project where I'm installing the operator. Here uh, you can see that uh, the uh, Cloud Pack for Data operator is getting installed. So uh, as soon as it is installed, it is uh, ready for use. Uh, so I'll show you uh, quickly how we can uh, install the control plane uh, directly from this um, uh, console. So I click on the um, .pack for data record and in the details, I can see uh, all the important services that we have been talking about in this uh, session, uh, all the uh, main services that are highlighted here for the end customer. Uh, it also links out various storage and resource requirements uh, to the IBM Knowledge Center where user can look at what are the resources required and what is the uh, security constraints that uh, that the platform uses. So uh, I'll quickly go and create the control plane uh, wherein I, I need to specify the uh, the service name that, I, that, that I'm interested in, uh, namely uh, the control plane in technical terms is called light. I specify the storage class and then I just accept the uh, license terms and conditions. So what this does is uh, it installs the uh, control plane, uh, which basically uh, sets up the uh, Cloud Pack for Data web client and from where uh, and users can get started on it easily. Uh, so in the same cluster, I have another project where, where I have installed a couple of other uh, Cloud Pack for Data services. Uh, so here you can see uh, we have installed all the important services that we have listed, uh, namely AI OpenScale, Watson Machine Learning Service, uh, DB2 Warehouse, and uh, WKC. That's all I have to uh, share. Uh, thanks, Verinda. And any questions, uh, feel free to uh, reach, reach out to me. Thank you so much, Partha. And I request everyone, if you want to try out this operator, we're going live on the Red Hat Marketplace on December 10th, so you can try it out. We have a trial as well. Maybe, uh, Travis, why don't you quickly show us um, a quick demo of the end-to-end -end platform? So, Travis, uh, do you mind sharing your screen? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Travis Jenneret. I am a senior architect with IBM, focusing around our data and AI portfolio. And today, I'm going to walk through a quick 15-minute demo for you around Cloud Pack for Data. All right. So I'll start off with a couple of slides and kind of setting up the stage for the demo. Uh, so let's talk through what do you need in the data and AI platform, right? From an IBM standpoint, we have a very prescriptive approach. We break it down into these four overall domains around collect, organize, analyze, and diffuse. 
uh, and you can kind of read through the details. But if you start with the collect side, it's about how you access data, where the data is, bringing the data forward, pushing workload down to the data. It's how do you make data access simple and repeatable. From an organized standpoint, think about that as data ops, right? So the ability to discover data, understand your data quality, uh, capture and publish that information out to an asset repository for reuse, with the goal being how can you set up shopping for data for your data scientists, your data um, analysts, and, and other folks. On the analyze side, it, it's all around providing the right tools to the right people at the right time. This may be where everyone wants to start, um, but without those first pieces that are uncollected and organized, your, anal your analyzing just isn't quite as valuable. Uh, but if you look at it, you also want to make sure that you can now democratize that ability that whether it's a coder or someone that likes to drag, someone that likes to click, that you can access the right tools for the right skill level so they can get their work done. And then a big piece with that as well is also the ability then to collaborate and have reuse. And a piece that I love to talk about is around Infuse. And, and the biggest part about that is, is a lot of organizations will um, be able to, to get the data. They'll be able to, to get some good skilled data scientists or others that can then get some insight. And then they fall down with how quickly or how not quickly it takes them to actually infuse those that pieces of insight, that pieces of, of knowledge back into the business to, to get value. Right? And so what is a platform that does all of that? Uh, that's the purpose of Cloud Pack for Data and its ability to be the deployment platform for multiple analytical and AI-based microservices that, that fulfill that requirement. And the great part about it is it's definitely part of IBM's hybrid cloud strategy. So it fits across whether it's in an IBM cloud, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, uh, deploy to the edge, uh, install within your own private network, or even have a pre-built system that can house that for you. All right, so let's take one quick deep look under the covers of Cloud Pack for Data so you can kind of see where this is before we go into a demo. So at its base, there's a control plane layer that's built upon uh, Red Hat OpenShift that's now part of IBM. Uh, as part of that, there's a, a small Cloud Pack for Data specific control plane on top of that that is a common framework around backup and restore, authentication, workload management, et cetera. And then the magic on top happens first in the base area around Cloud Pack for Data. So within those same four domains, collect, organize, analyze, and infuse, uh, there's various microservices where each microservice can be deployed independently. You can have just one of those running within your environment or have all of them or any combination thereof, right? So under collect is things such as a streaming engine, uh, data virtualization is very popular, uh, data warehouse, put a Spark engine uh, in place. Uh, then under organize, it's one of the industry leading uh, platform for data governance around a Watson knowledge catalog solution. Uh, under analyze, it could be as simple as making a, a, an embedded dashboard, really quick and easy dashboard visualizations. Or you may want to jump into the Watson Studio tools where you can have and use our auto AI functions or jump into a Jupyter notebook, um, into a data, data refinery, uh, data wrangling job, for example. Then on the right, OpenScale, um, which is to monitor models that you've deployed, and watch the machine learning is the ends up being the runtime environment to, to deploy models and to do that work. Uh, on top of that, we have a whole set of extensions. So depending on your project and your project needs, we could add third-party tools such as, as Pro Postgres. Uh, we could do DB2 Advanced um, running on the platform. We also have a lot of other pieces around master data management, virtual data pipeline, uh, ETL data stage components, et cetera. And then there's a Cognos Analytics, Planning Analytics, including our Watson Studio Premium pieces, which adds an SPSS visual modeler onto the, onto the palette for data scientists, as well as decision optimization engine, uh, known as CPLEX and Hena Pass Life. Um, and then obviously our uh, natural language processing and other capabilities such as Watson, Watson Assistant, uh, natural language processing, speech to text, text to speech, uh, Watson Discovery, uh, Watson Financial Crimes Insight is another popular piece that goes on top, right? So uh, under the covers, those are all various microservices that are available and accessible through Cloud Pack for data. Um, now let's get into a demo where we can see some of those pieces right there uh, in action. So let me just set up my demo scenario, uh, fictitious, telecommunications company, we're looking at um, a marketing campaign. Right now we have a, a new 
a phone release coming up pretty soon, but we also have competitors that are poaching all of our customers, right? So our, our goal is to get a better, better understanding, better working and quick, quicker to deploy propensity to churn model. Um, in this scenario, I'm going to do, do this all in the next 15 minutes uh, for an end-to-end uh, demonstration. And, and so here's what you're going to see just as part of the demonstration today, right? So take a look at that same cloud pack for data. Uh, the first phase we're going to take a look at is uh, what would be performed by a data engineer or a data steward. So we're first going to use the data virtualization technology and show how it can connect to multiple data sources. Then we're also going to show the results of doing a discovery and data profiling on those different data sources. And you can see then how they would be published uh, for use within a data catalog. Uh, the second swim lane we're going to go through is kind of take on the, the role of a, of a data scientist or a business analyst. We're going to shop for data. We're going to use auto AI, which is a new function within CloudPack for data in the last couple of releases to, to build a predictive model. Then we're going to quickly promote that model out to a deployment space, which is a unique uh, production ready place for deployment of models. And then we're going to go ahead and show how we can then take that model and actually deploy it as an online or batch service and how and then show how it would be infused into applications. All right, so let, let's take a look and get started. All right, so let me get into a web browser. All right, so here is my Cloud Pack for Data instance. Um, like I said before, uh, let's first do some talking around the collect piece, right? Uh, just to, to navigate the screen, um, uh, I'm logged in as an administrator, so I do have access to everything. So I'll play all the roles of my team today, including the data engineer and data scientist and person who's going to do the, the deployment of the model. And we'll start off with the fact of the first screen will show me a, a various set of tiles and interactions that can be modified and customized um, <clears throat> per a user basis. And so for here, uh, I can see that a bunch of different activities I have going on within my environment. I'm going to go off into data virtualization. Let's take a peek there first. Um, so I went ahead and did some pre-work, so I have 15 minutes for this demonstration. Um, and you can see right here, here are a whole set of various databases and different kind of data repositories that I already have a set of some pre-built connections. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and as part of this, so for example, Mongo, uh, MySQL, Oracle, DB2, Postgres, MariahDB, are all different pre-built connections that I have uh, went ahead and configured. And now I have my own data virtualization um, central node that is able to reach out and connect to each of these in a constellation kind of view where I can now set up um, and expose a view of this data to users of this platform or users of, external, uh, users of external platforms that want to do things. So I could go in and let's take a quick peek at some of my own virtualized data that I have established. So within those, uh, let's take a look just at a few of the tables. So here's, here's a few of the tables that are out there right now. Um, as part of my customer churn demo that I'm going to build, I'm going to need access and information around customer satisfaction data, customer billing, customer profile, separate tables that could be um, tables across multiple different database platforms, across multiple places within the organization or in the cloud. Um, if I wanted to show how quick it is to for data engineer to take, say, two different databases, two different tables, and join them together and expose them as one single view out to, to an end user so they don't have to do that work. I can simply come in, uh, notice that these are the two ID fields. I can grab and drag and drop those across each other as the key fields. Um, if I am an SQL expert, I can dive into SQL code and actually build out um, my own piece in here by hand. Uh, me, but I'm just going to use the editor that already has those pieces there. Hit next. Um, I can change column names if I so desire. Nope, I'm going to hit next. And then now I have an option to go ahead and take this new view and publish it out either as part of an individual project within the Cloud Pack for data environment. I can fulfill a data request, or I could just save it off into my own virtualized data, which, which is what I'm going to do. We're going to call this just a, a demo customer join view. And I can hit create and go out and take a look at that. So what did that do? Well, that went out now and created this new view that I have right here as part of my demonstration. If I go look at that view, 
Um, there's multiple, I can set up who, who can access it. I can submit it to a centralized catalog for multiple uses. Let's go take a look actually just a, a preview of that data, right? So I have authority via my ID and password to actually view this data. You can see there's now 16 columns of data. That's a combination of profile data um, and billing data. So things such as marital status, number of children, estimated income, are you a car owner? Um, just some basic information associated uh, with some subscribers. I take a quick look at table structure. Like I said, there's 16 columns. Metadata, I can see this is, comes from two different table sources, um, 16 columns total, um, and it's making a, a custom SQL uh, view into all that data. That's perfect and good. And now what I can do is actually I can take that particular view and I can now either assign that directly to someone's individual project or I can just submit it to the catalog and have it be part of an asset repository that all users could, could see and use. Um, just to, for a quicker demo, I've already put those pieces out there, so I'm not going to kind of go into those right now. But one last piece that I will talk about around data virtualization that's very, very powerful is cache management, right? So I can actually come in and see what types of queries have been running against my data virtualization over the last, say, seven days, uh, the last 24 hours, right? And I can see those pieces up in the last 60 days. Um, I can see, hey, you know what? There's, there's quite a few queries. There's 35 that's not using caching that's actually taking between one and 10 seconds. So I can actually go in and understand what those queries are and create a, a new active cache for those particular queries or for those particular tables. And then I can control my storage and everything else about it, right? So me as a, as a data engineer, I can make it so that the platform handles the queries and takes pressure off of some of my backend systems. All right, so so part of that, so what would I do next with this data, right? Next, usually I would go through and then discover this data. Maybe I want to profile and look at data quality associated with this data. Well, I went ahead and kicked off some data quality jobs and already ran those through the system. Uh, here's some of the results of the data quality jobs that I ran. One for the customer SAT table, one for the customer profile table, and one for the customer billing table. Um, as you can see, uh, it shows here's the data quality, which is some high data quality. This has one note with it, um, six different um, terms that it assigned to it. So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's, let's go take a look in here and see. Um, if I take a look at the columns, here shows the six columns associated with that data. Um, and by using AI's and machine learning capabilities, it went through and said, hey, we have a bunch of dictionary terms and according to this, according to the title and or the data itself, I'm going to uh, make the assumption and assume via the, the models that uh, dropped calls is equal to a dropped call ter term that we have that, that's out there. So that's part of the analysis that it did was to match terms to columns. Uh, but also went through each individual column and gave a quality score. So there, there's hundreds of pre-built quality metrics, which you can use as is, or you can make copies of and customize to, to your heart's content about how you set up, set up your baseline for data quality. Um, for example, complaints per month, I can actually click on it and dive into it a little bit more. I can take a look at that data quality. I can take a look at the, the frequency distribution of that data. Um, I can show that in the graphical form, right? So it, it goes through and it does the analysis and pieces with this, and then it gives me the ability then at the end where I can actually go ahead and publish these data results back out to my data catalog from a data scientist and, and teams to use. All right, so let, let's kind of continue on here. All right, so now I'm going to go back and change the role. So I was a data engineer, and I created some data um, connections via data virtualization. I did some discovery of data, profiling of data, and published that out to my enterprise catalog. Now I'm going to come back in as that data scientist, right? For my project of making some customer churn models, I first want to go find some data to go out and use. So I'm going to take a look at catalogs. I'm going to look into my customer data catalog. Uh, I can say, hey, guess what? Um, you know, Amy uh, and Joe, my, Joe is my data steward for my data ops uh, team. Um, Amy is my data engineer behind the scenes. She went ahead and took those same pieces of data that we were looking at before and has published them out to the catalog, right? And so what does that mean to publish them to the catalog? Well, you take the metadata and information associated with that data, publish it to an asset repository where it could match up a data dictionary, 
assets and different pieces together and give uh, end users the ability then to have a, a nice, simple web UI to search for that data and then use that data directly within a project. Um, so for example, I can see that uh, I can go into uh, what Watson recommends based upon my profile, what I normally do. I can also go into highly rated and see which ones have some rating to it. So let's go take a look at this customer profile data that's right here. Uh, given authority, it's first going to show me a quick view of that data itself. Um, you can see details of it. I want to go in and take a look at that review that was done. So Susie, who's a member of my data science team, um, put a little comment in here a couple weeks ago saying how this is the data set that she uses around customer history, which would be good for my, my predictive churn model that I want to create. I can look at the profile of that data. So as a data scientist, without having to dive into code, I can see the distribution of this data and if it makes sense for me to want to use this data quickly. So for example, I can see that marital status is pretty evenly distributed across a couple of options that are in here. Estimated income has a decent distribution uh, with, with a min, max, um, and a mean that's in there. And then um, other things that are in here as well, such as age, month as a customer, uh, membership and date, et cetera, right? I could also see the lineage of that data, which is gonna show me some interesting things, such as um, here's when it was first published to the catalog. Um, here's when the, the first data profile was created. And, and then, oh, by the way, um, there's been multiple times where this asset's been used in other projects. So I can see that. I can even contact the people um, to, to go in and see about what information they have from the past and, and their experience using this data format. All right, so I'm shopping for data. You know what? Uh, this data is good to go. I want some individual data sets, and I also want um, this joined data set. So Amy created a single view joined data set across customer profile, billing, and SAT um, for the project. You can take that as well. And it's as simple as going to add to my project. Uh, I can pull up a list such as churn, um, and I can go ahead and, and add that into my project. Um, I already added them earlier just to speed the demo up, so I'm not going to show that now. But that's the quick and easy way to take data and assets and quickly add them to your project. And think about the amount of time that that saves you and the ability to, to shop for data. All right. So data scientist, I have the data that I want. I've added it to my project. Let's go take a look at that project. All right. I'm going to go into churn. So what is a project? So a, a project is a uh, scoped space that's on the server that is specific to whoever created it and then whoever they have added as additional collaborators within your project. For here, uh, Susie, uh, Clarenda, and Amy are all um, some of the collaborators that are associated with this particular project. Um, but a project is a collection of assets that only I can see and is protected. And then any work that I do will keep it within the scope of this project, but I still have the ability to publish results back out to say an original data store or out to the data catalog, right? In this scenario, uh, here is all the data assets. So here's like the customer satisfaction, customer profile, customer billing. Uh, here is that extra data set that Amy had created for me. That is a combination single view using data virtualization. Um, I can go in and take a look at that as an example. So if I'm a data scientist, I can come in, take a look at this data. So this is doing a real time query back out to that database and pulling information back for me and I can see uh, profile and lineage, the same kind of things that I was able to, to see before. Um, but now within the project scope, I can see, well, what have I done with this data within the project, right? Which published to the catalog. Uh, I can add it to a data flow. I can do different things with that data, but have a lineage of what the team has done and how they've used it within a project space, which is, which is pretty impressive. All right. So uh, I guess this is a collection of assets. Well, so what kind of assets can I put into my project space? Well, let's take a look. I can go to add to project. Uh, I can, I can uh, import new data that's uh, scoped within my project. I can make a new data connection that's scoped to within the project. I can make a new auto AI experiment. I can do a new modeler flow, which is a graphical view into, into building models. I can uh, make a new Watson machine learning a detailed model or deploy things out for runtime. I can make a, some visual uh, dashboards without having to write code. 
I can create a new notebook. Uh, data Refinery is a self-service data wrangling tool. So if I want to do that within my project to say uh, update some data, there's also a decision optimization piece. So uh, I've already used Data Refinery. So I went ahead and took a combination of those three tables as customer billing, customer profile, customer satisfaction. And I combined that with a separate CSV of customer churn history that I received. And I created a new data set. That new data set you can see here on the left is called Merge Customer Churn. So I want to use that uh, and create a new predictive model quickly before all my time expires. Um, all right, so I'm going to make a new uh, churn demo, and I can pick the configuration settings for eight CPUs, et cetera. Let's just go ahead and make this um, four CPUs to start with and create. So what is auto AI and what does it do for me, right? So think about um, if you're not the, the whiz bang data scientist type that knows how to code everything you want inside of Python, or even doesn't understand modeling that much at all from a data science perspective. What if you could use AI from a click and point and click perspective and have it build a model from you uh, for you from, from scratch? And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna take a look inside of my project and here is the merge customer churn data that I wanna use. I'm gonna select that asset. It's gonna go ahead and read that data set for me. And it's gonna it's gonna suggest, here are all the potential columns, which one would you like to do a prediction upon? Um, so for us, I'm gonna, I wanna predict churn. And since it is a, a representation of the data as being true and false, it suggests what's called a binary classification, right? Which is just a, a, a type of algorithm or a type of, of work that just predicts between two distinct categories, which is true or false in this scenario. Um, I can leave it just as it is and, and run my experiment just like that. Uh, I'm gonna dive in just a little bit deeper just for those that have an interest in what's happening under the covers for auto AI. Um, as you can see here, um, it's going to go ahead and do a 90-10 split for my data as far as 90% used for training, 10% holdout to do for some testing and things afterwards, right? Um, I can see all the columns that are going to be part of the, um, the feature set for my model, and I'm just going to go ahead and just keep them all for right now. I can do sampling if it's a, if it's a larger data set. I want to use a smaller group set to, to speed up the results. If I go into prediction, um, you can tell, hey, it, it suggests that this, once again, is a binary classification, which, which, which is the right choice that it should make. Um, I could change it and override it to do a multi-class classification, or if it was a different type, um, I could have it do a regression algorithm type as well. Um, and it has a, um, one of the things that you want to do is you want to look at, well, how do I want this to judge what is a success and not a success or the best model that it can find for me? Well, I'm going to have it based upon accuracy, right? But that's the best choice for a binary classification. Um, I could also do these other ones, um, and it actually will show me the results for all of those, but I want to do it by accuracy. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole set of algorithms I want to test. I can also decide, well, how many of these algorithms does it want to put through all the paces? I want to go ahead and do four, four algorithms. Uh, it's going to generate 16 separate pipelines of work for me. All right, so save that, hit run experiment. So what's that going to do? Um, it's going to go through and do a set of activities. Let me swap the view into kind of this uh, tree kind of view. So it's going to read the data set. It's going to take uh, the 90 10 split of that. It's going to read through all that training data. And it's going to start looking at um, the pipelines that it's going to need for the data. And it's going to do some pre-processing. It's going to clean up some of the data, take a look and see what's categorical, numerical, do all that kind of work for you so you don't have to, to know about it. It's going to pick uh, the best four algorithms based upon the data set and the, the type of inputs. And then for each of those, it's going to run through some things. It's going to um, first just do a straight test using that algorithm and see what the result set is. And then it's going to take that result set and then do some hyperparameter optimization to see if it can improve the model and get a result set. Then it's going to do some feature engineering um, and get the results of that, and then do one more pass on top of that with some additional hyperparameter optimization. And it's going to do that across all four of the algorithms that it goes out there uh, and selects. So, uh, so, so this could take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to run. So I'll let that run in the background. And let's go take a look at the, the same one that I ran uh, earlier so you can see the results of what that looks like from AutoAI.
All right, so that one's still running. Uh, this one was completed a while back. Let me open this one up and show you the, the results set from what it did. All right, so here's the same model, the same results set that the other ones should be able to get as well. Um, as you can see that there's four different algorithms right here that it shows, XGB classifier, gradient boost, random forest, LGBM. Um, and it ran through each of those. And the starred one right here is the one that it gave as the as the number one result set from the work that was done. Um, I can also swap the view if you want to get it's a different view into the result set, uh, which includes, um, here's the LGBT classifier, uh, here's the model that it did, and it shows you the, the feature transform, transformations and the hyperparameter optimization that, that it did as part of that. So you can actually go through here and see the, the details of, of all the ones that it worked through. What I want to show you, though, is so here's the pipeline comparison of those 16 different pipelines that were run through. Uh, and there's accuracy, area under the curve. So accuracy is the one that it judged it upon. So I can actually kind of, let's, let's narrow that down to the first to the first few. So here's like the top five or six um, algorithms associated with accuracy. There was the pipeline three, pipeline four. Let's go look at pipeline 15. That's the one that actually shows the as being the best result set. Um, so instead of doing that, let me kind of go back here and let's take a look down below because so here's all the 16 of the pieces that were run. Here's the ranking order of those 16 along with the um, accuracy that was came out of it. So pipeline 15 using the LGBM classifier uh, with the first pass to run the hyperparameter optimization plus the feature engineering. I can actually open that up. Let me just dive into it a little bit deeper so you can see it. So if I'm a data scientist and I want to see what was behind the covers, I can say, hey, so there was initial accuracy. Uh, here's all the measures that were uh, the resultant set with, with the normal holdout or cross validation score. Um, I can look at what's called the confusion matrix to see about what, what were false positives and false negatives, which this turns out to be extremely accurate model. I can take a look at that model information itself, which shows that it was an LGBM classifier with 40 different features and then over 1,100 uh, evaluation instances. I can take a look at what were the features that it created. So a combination of say estimated income, uh, how many months as a customer, late payment charges, um, so on and so forth. And then feature importance. So this actually will tell me which features were important as part of this, um, as part of this model that was created, right? So estimated income actually had the biggest overall impact on whether or not that person was going to churn, right? An interesting thought. Who would have known that before? But it, but it does make sense, right? Because it may put him in a different social economical class. He may have the funds or the ability to potentially um, change carriers easier or maybe not, right? Um, so th those are the results. And I can take this and I can actually now take and save this off as a model back into my project space. And so this now would be a standalone model that I can now deploy as, a, as an online model. This is a demo model. I'm gonna save that off into my space. Um, but before, so before we go to take a look at that, let's say that I'm a data scientist, but I'm a coder, right? I love jumping into Python and I don't know if I'm gonna trust this or not. I mean, it's good, but I think I can always do better, uh, which you know, maybe, maybe not, right? This is a really powerful tool. But I could also go take and export this auto AI model out as a notebook. So if I take a look and let that generate a new notebook, let's hit create the notebook. This actually will join, um, will come out and show me an entire notebook written in Python that is exactly what the tool did behind the scenes. And I can tweak that, I can rerun it. There's all kinds of things like I can now do um, within this notebook to show, um, that shows the same result as was done with, with the model, right? So it's very powerful, especially with the ability that to see under the covers on what model that the auto AI features built for you. All right, so where are we now? Let me go back up to my churn model. And so, okay, so my, my, my churn project overall, right? Um, here's a new auto uh, AI experiment. This one's still running. Um, here's the new notebook that I just created based off of that. And oh, by the way, here is that new model that I had deployed out um, to use uh, later on. So my next step that I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and promote this model. I'm gonna promote this model up into what's called a deployment space. So a deployment space is where you would go through 
um, and actually deploy models as an online or, or batch kind of model. And you can do it through the tooling or through an API. So you can use Jenkins or other kind of ways to, to, to automate the whole MLOps process. I'm going to promote that out to the deployment space. And let's go take a look at that new deployment space that is out there. All right, so there, there's two assets. One asset is the model that I created uh, previously and had already promoted out there. And the second one is a model that we just created. So let's go through now, and I want to go ahead and um, deploy that model out to, a, to be an online runtime model. Let me show you how easy and quick that is to do. All right, so right here, I can choose, I don't want this to be an online or a batch model, right? I want this to be an online model with the deployment. Uh, this is my demo churn model that I want to deploy, hit create. So what is this going to do? So this is going to take that model. It's going to package it up within its own container within the Cloud Pack for Data platform. And then go ahead and deploy that out as a pod or as a container within the Kubernetes environment and have it be a new online model. And then it's going to return back to me the, the details about that model and how I can access it and test it. All right. So while that's deploying, let's just go back to the one that are the one that I've already deployed out there. So I go into my deployments. Um, well, actually, it's it's already done and deployed. So that that's how, that was quick and easy. So now we we have the one we just created is now online as a, as a as a usable model. I'm going to use the one that I created earlier because I already have some sample data ready to test with it. All right. So the first thing that I see here is that uh, my model is deployed. It's online. I see that there's one copy out there running. I could change this. Um, and so let's say that I want to have um, higher availability and higher throughput. So that there's multiple things want to access this model at the same time. I can actually create multiple instances or copies of this out of my environment. Simple and easy to do just by changing that and hit save. Um, here is the direct endpoint link as a RESTful interface out to my model so now i can infuse that into other applications and oh by the way here's some example code snippets on how you would go and access um access that model from within your own application here's a curl command uh, here's some sample java code some sample javascript code that you can copy and paste uh, python scala so it gives you some examples of what you can do to quickly infuse that into your existing applications um, I want to do a quick test on this. Let's use the, the built-in test harness, right? So I can go through here and type in, uh, fill in the different attributes and fields and test out the result. Uh, to speed that up quick, what I want to do is um, I've already saved off in, the, in a JSON format some sample data. So let me go do that here quick. All right. Uh, so for example, in this data, uh, it's a male, married, $130,000 uh, a year estimated income, has a car, um, has the unlimited plan. Uh, you can see that uh, he's had zero complaints in the last month, one complaint in the last year. So it's your, it's your average kind of customer. I can just hit the predict. And that now went out and tested my model, right, and came back with the prediction and, and the probability of that, right? So um, that comes back with is, is, is uh, false, which means that, very unlikely to churn, and it's a 99.9% .9 uh, probability of that of that of not not churning. Right? Uh, I can make some quick tweaks to this. What if I came in and said, you know what? He actually had um, three complaints and two complaints in the last month. Right? Uh, a very you know telltale sign of someone that's unhappy has a decent income is married and has the ability to change carriers easy. Let's see what happens from this very accurate model. Um, so with those attributes, you can quickly see how uh, this person is likely to churn and he has a 98.8% chance, 98.9% chance to actually churn. All right, so, um, so th this concludes my demo, but I just wanted everyone to see how quick and easy it is to look through the entire life cycle of collecting data and organizing that data. And from a data science perspective, the ability to use auto AI to quickly generate a predictive churn model, and then how easy it is to use the tooling or use the APIs to then go ahead and promote and deploy that model into a highly available runtime uh, to actually get its uh, use out there for, for the business. All right, so uh, thank you again, and hope you enjoy the demonstration. Thank yeah. you. It uh, it was really a good 
um, overview of the platform itself. Quickly, uh, we will be moving on to, um, you know, one of our other great achievements as release is we've onboarded on the Tech Data Stream 1 marketplace. And um, um, I, would, I would like just to showcase, you know, what we're really doing with our global distributors, partners, et cetera. So, um, Clay, why don't we start off with you telling the audience about your role at Tech Data and before that with IBM? First, let me say it's it's really a pleasure to be here with you and, and the folks here. I mean, I've been looking forward to this for some time and be virtually sitting with someone uh, who's really smart and talented like you is a, is a pleasure. So, um, well, I'll start with my time at IBM. Um, I spent eight years at IBM, all within the data and AI organization, um, working with great people like you and Travis and others. And um, I held a number of roles during my time at IBM, but my final role was directly working with Cloud Pack for Data as a sales leader in North America. Um, my team was responsible for driving sales and, and impacting, helping impact product direction and um, you know for the new solution, this new solution of Cloud Pack um, with, within IBM. And then um, earlier this year, I began a new chapter in my career when I moved over to Tech Data, but I didn't stray far from IBM. I still work with IBM almost every day, and uh, a lot of it is around Red Hat and uh, Cloud Pack for Data. And so at Tech Data, we're a global distributor, and uh, there I'm responsible for leading our data, IoT, and AI practice globally. So I work with both vendors like IBM and Red Hat, as well as our business partners and resellers to kind of optimize the impact that we can have through the channel ecosystem. Um, so it's a really interesting space to be as I now kind of have a broader view of the market and how best to help our vendors and our partners. Glad to have you, Clay. And it's been it's been an amazing ride. Um, this partnership between Cloud Pack for Data and Tech Data um, has definitely been building some buzz. So do you want to tell our audience a little bit about how it can change the game for customers? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, look, as you know, through my, my background, Cloud Pack for Data is near and dear to my heart. So I, I really love what IBM is doing with, with OpenShift um, through the Cloud Packs, you know, even beyond just Cloud Pack for Data. Um, so, you, you know, so much so that when I arrived at Tech Data earlier this year, you know, one of my, one of my highest priorities, if not my number one priority, was to uh, ensure that the channel ecosystem knew the power of cloud packs, you know, and especially cloud pack for data. So, um, you know, we kind of found that in order to, how best to put this, like effectively absorb this this power of cloud pack for data. I mean, you saw Travis go through that, um, you know, just a very brief demo um, of the robustness of cloud pack for data. But in order to kind of harness that power or absorb that power, that the channel ecosystem, so our resellers and our partners, we're definitely gonna need some assistance. Um, and so thanks to the power of OpenShift, right, Cloud Pack for Data can be deployed on, on any cloud, which is a huge thing for our channel and for our, our clients. And so as a distributor, we work with so many partners that, you know, and we work with all these cloud vendors. So we set out to ensure that we can build the most effective way for Cloud Pack for Data to be consumed. And so that's what we did together, right? Our, our team at Tech Data, your team at IBM, we built a solution of Cloud Pack for Data that we, we term a click to run solution. So really what that means is we just make it really easy for our partners to, to sell Cloud Pack for Data and therefore get IBM and OpenShift into more end users' hands and um, go help deliver business outcomes. Awesome, awesome, Faith. That's really yeah, good. Yeah, and yeah, and uh, kind of a similar question that you asked me, but I'd love to know what uh, you know to ask you to comment on what our announcement means to IBM and and especially to IBM business partners. It's really exciting. Um, you know, Tech Data has over a thousand global vendor partners, as we know, operating in more than hundred countries, and uh, you know, onboarding Cloud Pack for Data on this global IT marketplace, Stream One. Uh, which will help streamline the buying, selling, and other services automated and offered to the global partners is awesome. Um, you know, additionally, as you're aware, um, you know, just what Travis showed uh, with our hybrid cloud ecosystem strategy, customization is very key. And tech data is definitely, as, as a value-added distributor, 
It meets our customers where they are with solutions that are more innovative yet less costly, offering comprehensive services um, you know, to foster um, this wider adoption. So to provide that expertise and to help um, both our business partners and customers not only to deploy large scale solutions from technology providers, but um, you guys are helping them customize uh, them to their specific priorities. Not to forget, um, you know, the click to run automation that we developed um, to deliver this on the stream one marketplace of tech data, which is definitely going to be a unique value for our partners. So simplifying some of the most, I feel, time consuming and complicated parts of uh, deployments um, and in automating complex processes such as infrastructure, platform, software as a service deployments, building connections, configurations and integrations is something that I feel is really going to cater to our business partners um, and to our clients. Um, so Clay, coming back to um, why do you think Tech Data selected Cloud Pack for Data, you know, amongst um, the other solutions? Wow, great question. Yeah, I mean, we kind of have uh, we kind of have our pick, honestly. I mean, we we work with so many vendors and even partners that have their own solutions. Um, I guess I'll, I would kind of narrow it down to two reasons. First, as I mentioned earlier, like we work across our cloud vendors, and so we wanted to make sure that we had a solution that would not only work with right the vendors cloud, so in this case IBM, but you know, Azure and AWS and others. And obviously Cloud Pack for Data allows this open shift. Um, and second, we know that more clients are looking for that all-in-one solution to drive business outcomes. And Cloud Pack for Data accomplishes this by, you know, kind of uh, some of the aspects that Travis went through, but it's to really simplify this. And this is um, how IBM's, you know, effectively marketed this solution. It's by allowing users to go and collect data, organize that data, and then analyze that data, you know, all before being able to infuse that into their organization to use it in the most effective way possible. So, um, I mean, it's kind of a short answer, but you know, for those two reasons, it really made Cloud Pack for Data a no-brainer for us to pursue and, and to go build this market-ready solution and, and put it on our on our ecosystem platform and, um, and kind of get off and running. Very interestingly, um, and I assume, I mean, you mentioned it already, uh, but I see, I know that you're already seeing a lot of value from the integration with Red Hat OpenShift um, on, on Stream 1 already. Yeah, you're right, Clorinda. I mean, I mean, we probably can't say it enough, but it, it really, it speaks, that, that first reason I gave above, right, where we can work across cloud vendors, um, you know, seamlessly, it, it, it speaks to the power of OpenShift. And, um, and this is such a big deal for our, our channel ecosystem. And so, you know, we, we know that we live in a multi-cloud world, um, but, you know, especially when you think about the channel, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, organizations and resellers that are still working, working that out, right? Figuring out which, where, where do they land? Where do their customers want to be, right? And, and trying to work, you know, through in a business outcome landscape. So, um, being able to, you know, we know that it's a multi-cloud world. We know that Kubernetes is the future and being able to effectively expose that to the partner ecosystem, I think is really, really important. So this, you know, the seamless integration of OpenShift and kind of what it enabled when we built the solution. And, and again, what we're exposing our partners and end user to is, um, is really is much needed. And frankly, it's just really exciting. So, um, I, and what's interesting is, uh, obviously, I, I gave a little bit of my background, but you know, I've worked with Cloud Pack for Data extensively in the past. But you know, I've I've been out of the every day for the last you know nine to twelve months. So um, you know, I, I'd be really curious to hear you know how it's going recently. You know, you covered the three point five release already, but um, maybe we'll start with what's your favorite new new feature that customers can use, um, especially when especially especially when we think about this click to run solution that we have. Yeah, definitely. That's a that's a very good point. So let me quickly um, showcase what would be my favorite capability in Cloud Pack for Data. So I think innovation is definitely one of those areas um, that um, that has been very attractive. So one of the capabilities we are actually bringing in um, this release, frankly speaking, is our Watson Machine uh, Learning Accelerator in the base. 
um, and it allows, I think it allows, uh, you know, everybody to use deep learning on GPUs. It makes it much more easier for data scientists for this distributed deep learning architecture that simplifies the process of training uh, deep learning models across the cluster for faster time to results, um, as well as powerful model development tools in real time for training visualization, as well as runtime monitoring of accuracy and some of the hyperparameter optimizations we just saw in uh, Travis's demo uh, for faster model deployment. So I think this is one of the uh, great capabilities that's coming in Cloud Pack for Data. One of the other capabilities, which is in early stages by IBM research team, but it's definitely a new cutting edge technology, and it's a new concept that I feel everybody should try out, is um, our federated machine learning uh, capability, uh, which enables multiple organizations to train ML models collaboratively uh, without having to share data. And so you can imagine uh, what this really means. The driving factor behind this is definitely data privacy, confidentiality, regulations, and even the cost to move the data, right? So it's machine learning uh, without moving your data. And you can, you know, you might have your data on AWS, IBM Cloud, on premises, and without moving the data from these locations, you can have a centralized data aggregator iterate and build and bring ML to where your data lives. So I think these couple of capabilities, uh, I would say are definitely um, uh, highlights uh, for this release, um, Clay from our end and, and folks should try it out. Those are really, really neat. Um, the federated learning especially, uh, we're gonna have to dive dive more into that at some point because uh, that sounds, sounds really neat and, and addresses a lot of the data privacy issues that we definitely see in the market. Definitely. Thank you so much, Clay. It's it's been amazing to have you um, um, on this on this webinar, and uh, we'll continue our partnership uh, going forward. Yeah, I look um, forward to it, Clarinda. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Um, so quickly before going back to the operator demo, there are a couple more capabilities I wanted to cover that are coming in Cloud Pack with Data. Um, one of them is um, data privacy. And um, many times, um, you know, uh, we, we have seen the need for um, uh, a lot of uh, data protection. That means you want to sometimes de-identify your data for data science. Um, you want business analytics and testing to be able to run on the same quality of data that you put into production that you're training your models with. And so this is one of the capabilities that's tightly integrated with our Watson Knowledge Catalog. Um, from data subsetting, fabrication for end users, and most importantly, it aligns with our governance strategy. Uh, to and you can even use this, um, you know, to provision your data uh, for test data, for your models in production with the same level of security. Um, and this capability is, is very useful. Um, one of the other capabilities I quickly want to highlight is that of knowledge accelerators. You know, we, um, in our governance portfolio, we have uh, data quality, data consumption, more from a self-service perspective, and we have data governance. And oftentimes, um, it's important to uh, understand the business uh, vocabulary um, of your technical data. Um, and building the business vocabulary is more than creating a word list. And it takes time to create a usable business vocabulary with definitions and business context. So to quickly get you up and running this release, we're bringing in the IBM Knowledge Accelerators. It's scaling the business vocabulary quickly out of the box for industries like healthcare, insurance, financial services, and even energy and utilities. Thank you, everybody, and congratulations again on this great new release. Look for it on the Red Hat Marketplace on December 10th. I just wanted to reiterate that because it's very important. Um, and being able to try it out. Um, we're very excited about that as well. And until next time, thank you everyone.